My name is John Mount. I'm a researcher, consultant, and trainer at WinVector LLC, a data science company that works on research, consulting, and training. And uh, my contribution for the Bay Area R User Group's ROC Day is I would like to show how to pick the optimal threshold for a for a project using the ROC plot. So basically, somewhere on the ROC plot is an ideal trade-off of sensitivity and specificity, and I'd like to show you how to find it on the ROC plot. So basically, this is a classic method of using the ROC plot. Also some code snippets of how we get that. And also, we're going to work in a context of what I call a scoring model or a probability model. So that is a model that returns continuous numbers, but has been trained for a classification problem. And I think that's one of the most important things we can teach in uh, data science and machine learning is for classification problems, that is problems where the dependent variable or outcome is a categorical, do not use hard classifiers or classification rules. Use numeric scores that contain so much more information than a hard rule, especially a hard rule with this default threshold of one half that so many classifiers have. And making the mistake of using a hard classifier or a decision rule too early, I think is what leads to a lot of complexity and mistakes in machine learning projects. And also, uh, Professor Norm Matloff has had some important criticisms in this direction, which I very much enjoyed. Um, I'm going to assume that we can specify some model utilities such that we have something to optimize over so that we can successfully do this business interview where somebody susses out their model utilities. And that's actually usually an iterative process. They will state some utilities, we'll show them the consequences of using those utilities, and then they will revise those utilities that maybe false positives are not so expensive to them once you show how much it perverts the model to avoid them or sorry, perverts the decision process to avoid them. And I'm going to include a couple new results and open research directions in this talk. I had a lot of fun playing with this. Now, I know this is ROC day. So however, let's I don't like working with undefined terms. So let's go ahead and define the ROC plot yet again. To my mind, it's exactly the set of shapes that can be achieved on an Etch-a-Sketch, which is this horrible children's toy from the 1960s in America um, that can be drawn by turning only the knobs clockwise. Uh, again, it's it, all the diagrams that start in the bottom left and go to the top right by turning the knobs only clockwise. It's just sort of a jovial way of saying it's exactly the set of curves that are monotone increasing simultaneously both in Y and X and also, empirical ROC curves have the nasty property that they're essentially piecewise linear. They're not really continuous smooth curves with a continuous derivatives. And um, anytime a datum is uniquely positive or negative, you get a horizontal or vertical jump. And the only way you can get jumps that are at different angles than horizontal or vertical is when a bunch of datums are tied with the exact same classifier score, which is actually considered a fairly negative outcome in the theory, in the significance theory of an ROC curve. So empirical ROC curves have this jagged appearance, no matter how much data you have. Now, what really is the ROC curve, all joking aside? It's for a given continuous model score, the trade-offs of every achievable specificity versus sensitivity. The x-axis is traditionally 1 minus specificity, or the false positive rate. It's what fraction of the population, specificity is what fraction of the population you were supposed to leave alone, you left alone, so you want that to be 0. Oh, sorry, you want that to be 1, and you want 1 minus specificity to be 0. And sensitivity is what fraction of the population you were supposed to interact with, with you picked up. So basically, you want to be right here in this graph. And when I was an angry young researcher, I used to plot sensitivity as a function of specificity, which I thought was a lot less confusing. However, I eventually got sick of the criticism of saying, of people simultaneously saying that that one, that wasn't the ROC plot, and two, it was the ROC plot done wrong. But I, uh, this is the traditional plot. You do any variation in it whatsoever, and it's not the name brand plot. Okay, so our example data source is available from this URL on uh, GitHub, and it, it's basically a uh, synthetic data source where we simulate the performance of a classifier 
or sorry, a classification score or a continuous score on a hard classification problem. Hard meaning that basically it's a yes-no problem, so a binomial classification. And there's some discussion of this on our blog, which is basically a lot of this talk is based on this article here, the second URL, and a couple others we'll share in the blog. What does the data look like? So let's, uh, we, we would start up an R and just take a look at the head of the table. And basically it's two columns. The first column is whether a deal converted or not. Each row is an instance, as always. This is the model format, model matrix format, which is how all data analysis has been done since you know 1950s, 1960s. Um, so basically, this was a sales lead simulation. So every row is a sale that either converted or didn't. And predicted probability is what probability the model thought the conversion would happen at. So the first row, the sale did not convert, and the model thought it only had a four in a thousand chance of converting. Second deal, the model did not convert, and the model essentially thought it had a two in a hundred chance of converting, much higher than the other one, but very, very low. Now, the ROC plot for this data, again, is this. And the way I like to do ROC plots is I like to use the WV plots package because it has a lot of related plots. So switching between plots is very easy. And it um, annotates in the area under the curve, which is the perceived area under the ROC curve, the shaded region. And again, a perfect score would put a dot way up here and we get an area of one. The diagonal line is the performance of a classifier that just, or a score that's completely random and unrelated to the outcome. So you get an area of a half just for showing up. So really only this area above the diagonal line is interesting. This is another WV plots view of the same uh, simulated classifier data. It's called a double density plot. I think it slows down or unwinds the ROC quite a lot. Uh, Dr. Nina Zumel, in her talk after this, will be showing some other graphs that also slow down and give you time to think about the data that is in the ROC plot. Um, I think she calls them threshold plots. But this is the double density plot. And what it is, is as the x-axis is the model score, which we're calling predicted probability. And we see for this example, the model score is really almost always small which is one of the many reasons not to use a hard decision rule because most of those have hard coded in them that if the score is above a half, it's a positive instance, and if it's below a half, it's a negative. It's the most likely decoding, so that is correct. However, for uh, something where the prevalence is very low, which was the case in this, most of these deals did not convert, um, it's typical that a well-calibrated classifier, its score will always be low. So it won't actually produce very many, if any, scores above a half. So if you cut at a half threshold, you just get the constant function that says nothing converts, which is highly accurate, but completely useless, which is one of the many, many reasons that accuracy is a very poor classification metric. So the double density plot is, uh, again, the x-axis is the model score. The y-axis is this abstract thing called density, which is actually the derivative of area. Both of these graphs are scaled such that the area under each colored curve is one. There's only two colors present. There's this greenish one to the left and this orangish one to the right. And this intermediate shaded region is just where the overlap. So the green area is one, the orange area is one. That lets us treat areas as probabilities. So basically, we can take a look at this proposed threshold, 0.02, and we can say 30% of the orange areas to the right of it, and maybe only 20% of the green areas to the right of it which is basically orange area to the right is um, true positives because orange is the distribution of model scores for the known true examples. Green is the distribution of the model scores for the known false examples. So whenever we pick a threshold, we say everything to the right, we declare as what we think might be true, which is different than what is true. And so any orange area to the left of a threshold is a false negative, and any green area to the right of a threshold is a false positive. So those areas are our mistakes. So really the ROC curve is just summarizations of various areas from this graph cut. So what we would want is the green area to be a density that, that is an infinitely high, tiny, thin spike at zero. We'd want all the negative examples to get a probability of zero predicted probability of zero, and we'd want the positives of the orange to be a very infinite thin spike at one. And obviously this is not it, but these two distributions are still discernible, that by picking a threshold you can get a very useful model in a business sense. 
And again, this double density plot induces this ROC plot. And again, ROC is the receiver operator characteristic plot. Now, some observations. For a calibrated probability model, that is a probability model where the expected value of the prediction equals the expected value of the outcome, i.e. it gets the grand probability right, which is a very low bar, like logistic regression is guaranteed to achieve this, at least on its training data. For a properly calibrated um, probability model, the double density actually contains a lot of information. We can actually read off the prevalence because we know the expected value of the positive cases and the expected value of the negative cases, and they have to obey a little algebraic equation. So there's a lot of information here. The it also might be at an inflection point or a slope one point on the ROC plot, but that requires some more assumptions that aren't true. So even though both the double density plot and the ROC plot are designed to ignore population prevalence, it is not supposed to not be visible in either plot. That These are both scaled of the same area one instead of areas proportional to how popular each was. That information is still somewhat leaking in, which is a fun little observation that we thought was somewhat new. So let's get actually back to a real problem at hand, optimizing for utilities. Well, let's do a very simple form of utility that basically now a hard classification rule. There's only two facts about the world. Each instance is either truly positive or truly negative, And each instance we either think is positive or think is negative. So there's four possibilities. The cross product of what the state of the world really is times our belief. The standard nomenclature is true positives are the things that really did convert for our sales example and did. True negatives are the ones that we thought would not convert and did not. So these are the two cases where we're correct. False positives are where we thought it would convert, but we were wrong. So these are actually negative examples that got scored as positives. False negatives are positive examples that got scored as negatives. And then these four facts our characterizations of our classifier's performance against known outcome data, plus the observed prevalence, which again is the rate of positive occurrences, these five numbers characterize our utility. So from um, a book that was uh, generously given to me, the uh, James Egan's Signal Detection Theory of 1975, the, it turns out the optimal point on the ROC curve where if your utilities are defined as a bonus for each one of these, that true positives are worth something, true negatives are worth something, possibly negative, possibly penalty. If these are four numbers are all your um, describe your utility plus your prevalence, then the optimal point on the ROC curve is where the derivative of sensitivity, which again is our y-axis, and that's why I love the WV plots ROC plot because it labels on the axes exactly what they are, both the sensitivity, true positive rate, false positive rate. It puts the double labeling on, which I think is really important. But basically, this is if dy dx is equal to this equation, then this is the optimal point because it's where the sensitivity specificity trade-off is matching your utilities. And again, the ROC plot is essentially a summary of all the optimal sensitivity specificity trade-offs. This is like an efficient frontier in the finance sense. We'd obviously like to be in this upper left here, but these are every possible trade-off of sensitivity to specificity achievable. And the math says this slope is where that is. And again, Every, the left-hand side, everything is what we want. The right-hand side is everything we know about the world. We know the prevalence. So this is sort of an upside-down odds of prevalence. And these are our true negative valuation, false positive valuation, true positive valuation, false negative valuation. So these are the four numbers we got from our business partner by an interview. Um, let's re-derive that equation. Um, I'm going to actually use Python and SymPy to do it. It's actually quite fun to do. The exact details of it are given by this URL here. But what we do is we enter every relation as a equation we want to equal zero. So we want the number of true positives plus number of false positives plus number of true negatives plus number of false positives to sum to the total population because every instance is one of these four counts. So we write that equality as this equation equals zero that the relations implicitly are all zero. The prevalence is defined as the number of actual positives, that's true positives and false negatives, divided again by the population total. Sensitivity and specificity are similarly defined. Um, and then our utility is equal to the number of true positives times how much we value every true positive, number of false positives times how much we value each false positive, number of true negatives times how much we value every true negative, number of false negatives 
times how much we value each false negative. So these are the uh, five equations of what we know about the world and what our utility is defined as. They're linear equations, so we can ask the Python solver to solve this relation array, eliminating the variables TP, FP, TN, FN, and utility. So this means it'll write each and every one of these five variables in terms of the remaining variables, which are just prevalence, sensitivity, specificity. And we pull out the utility solution. This is sort of the modern way we do algebra. Instead of me doing this with pen and paper, I ask a symbolic solver to do it. And I'm just sharing what the instructions were. I then substitute in this special differential form sensitivity not defined here, so that when I take the derivative um, with respect to specificity, diff, it knows that sensitivity depends on specificity. It's not an independent variable that has derivative zero, that there's a dependency. And what's that dependency? It's our ROC graph. We don't have an analytical solution for how sensitivity depend, de, diffs with respect to specificity, but it's this graph. Those are the slopes. So we get that and we solve for the ROC slope. And again, we have this minus sign here because actually we're taking the derivative with respect to one minus specificity. So that just reverses the signs because it's quite simple. And we get that solution solved for where the derivative is zero. That's an extreme point, good candidate for where the optimum is. The optimum is either going to be there or at one of the endpoints. It's not at one of the endpoints, so it's going to be there. And we solve. And that actually literally gave us the LaTeX for this. So that's the solver. Now, to actually use that solution, what do we do? We need to actually work over an idealization of the ROC curve. If you notice, we said we're looking for a place where the slope, our derivative, is equal to this. And as I said, the ROC curve doesn't have nice slopes. It has these stupid jumps. So what we do traditionally is we work on an idealized ROC curve. In particular, we might work on the convex hull, though this is piecewise linear. Like this segment here is a straight line, which is somewhat undesirable. But that at least has that each slope occurs in only one region, and slope is monotone decreasing in terms of 1 minus specificity. So we can work on that idealization of it. It's actually a quite easy idealization to get in WV plots. We just say add convex hall equals true, and we get this dotted line of the piecewise linear convex slope. Or we could, to make things a little easier, fit on the double density plot. And again, this upper plot is the density or distribution of the classifier score conditioned on whether the example is known to be positive or negative. We could fit each of those with a, an empirical beta distribution. I just did that by moment matching. I matched the mean and standard deviation of each of these. So we're saying this green curve of the distribution of the classifier score of negative examples is nicely abstracted to this beta distribution, and this one's abstracted to this. Obviously, it's not a completely faithful representation. We list the, lost this little bimodality, but this is an idealization. How do we get that idealization? Um, our SIGR statistics package has find, match, find ROC matching AB. It returns a li named list of four entities, shape one positive, shape two positive, because each of these betas has two shape parameters, usually called alpha beta, but R calls them shape one and shape two. So these two first parameters are the distribution of the green, and these two are the distribution of the orange. And it returns this named list that has these four values. And I use the wrapper unpack function to dump these into my workspace. Unpack says take shape one from the named list coming back from this function and write it into my workspace. And this documents that what came unpacked from here. This Unpack is a lot like Zealot, but it's specialized to use names, which I think is much more R-like. Zealot is essentially a nice package that imitates Python's tuple unpacking, because in Python's Python has tuples. Python tends not to use named lists. R doesn't really have a tuple concept, so I think names list, named lists are more fundamental. So I think the wrapper unpack is the right way to do it in R. But Zealot, uh, which was first, is a, is a different alternative. However, I think the unpack is the right way to do things. So this parametric fit is not a disadvantage. A low complexity parametric fit may in fact reduce variance because if the if the parameter file if the parameter, parametric family is actually correct how the data was generated, then we actually are using a great inductive bias. Though if the parametric family is wrong, we're introducing some bias because we're forcing it into a small degree parametric framework that's not quite right. So we may not be able to even write down quite right the answer. Um, I think this is a pretty good fit. So I'm not too worried about how much bias was introduced there. 
uh, we'll see better on the RC graph how close that fit is in another sense. So classically, this is not a disadvantage because our world where ROC plots are just a dump of the classifier's performance with respect to every possible threshold, that's not how ROC plots started. Originally, ROC plots were each point on the plot was actually an experiment. You would send somebody up the hill to run the radar at a certain power level, and then they would say, at that power level, I achieved this sensitivity and this specificity. And they would only be able to run two to five experiments. And they, I they believe they would actually spin the dial and run at sensitivity a half, spin the dial, run at specificity a half, and those two numbers were used to report what you wanted. So basically, there was no way to get a long detailed plot without parametric because they would only have two or five evaluations along this curve. So, so basically some comments on working parametrically. Um, the beta distribution is not the traditional parametric form of the ROC plot. There was about eight of them in the book I, I was given as a gift, which again, I want to thank Bob Horton for that. That was incredibly generous and unexpected of him. And the most common parametric family was actually the logit normal with matching variances. And it turns out the variances have to match or the score goes perverse that if one of the classes has a larger variance, then that class will have the highest score examples and the lowest score examples. So the score won't be monotone, that improvements in score always improve the outcome. And I have a nice write-up on that on your lopsided model is out to get you. And that's, I think this is an inversion of score we often see as data science practitioners. And I think it is a basic point that we should always add more evidence about the class we know the least about. I get those variances to match, and that's in that article. Um, for beta distributions, which again, not the common one to use, there's a different condition than matching variances or standard deviations. It's a, it's a certain conjugate relation in the AB, but that's not uh, evident in data quite as often. So back to our actual problem at hand. Um, let's define our, ver our utility. These are arbitrary utilities for our marketing problem on this sales conversion. We're going to decide which leads do we want to approach. And we're assuming that calling each lead costs us $5 or interacting with each lead costs us $5. So if it's a true positive, a lead that will convert if called, then our net value is the net revenue. Say we're going to make $100 net revenue minus the service cost. So we would be calling something that's going to convert is worth $95. Calling something that's not convert is worth negative $5. True negatives, leaving alone a lead that isn't going to sell is worth $0. And technically, um, a false negative, failing to call a prospect that would have converted is worth $0. But let's put a little one penny penalty there just to try to push the classifier for a little more breadth. We could say this is letting our competitor take our business. So this is just a value of uh, getting out there. This is usually not that big. Um, and then our prevalence is observed. I just basically type in our code this formula. The target slope is this. This left hand side is just a slope. And so I just plug in that formula in terms of our code, and it says the target slope is essentially five. We want the region on the ROC curve where the rise of a run is about five. So basically that's somewhere around here in this left-hand side. I plot the ROC curve. I've now added the command add beta ideal curve. That is that beta fit we just did. And it, see, it's really very close, especially in the left-hand side when we're operating. When you're on an ROC curve, you're almost always operating the left-hand side or right-hand side, depending on whether you want high specificity or high sensitivity. When you're trading these off, usually one of them is much more important to you, whether you're doing an initial screen or a final test. So we can also get this ideal curve line from SIGGER. This will return a data frame that has that ideal curve. And then because we now have that ideal curve, we can, compute, we can adjoin the slope which is just rise over run into that by hand using R. And then we can find where this slope is closest to our target slope using the wonderful R command, which.min. And it says, well, that happens at row 21,740. At this score, please remember this number. This is the classifier score that we say, if you're above this score, we're interested in you. It looks like it's around 2.1%. At this score, you achieve a specificity of 96%, a sensitivity of 36%, and the slope of 4.9. That was the number we were matching near. This is pretty close to our target slope. And it says the point's right here, and the match slope is that. This is where you want to operate your classifier. Now, 
so this sensitivity specificity to get the score we have to go to our data structure that related score to spent sensitivity and specificity because it's not portrayed on the graph but again that was one of the services that the sensitivity specificity graph does it already lane lands in a classifier score for you um, with respect to the beta abstraction so for your actual empirical classifier if it weren't beta generated you would actually have to use a lookup table for which score achieved every one of these and that's not really a problem so an alternative to slope matching is actually rotate your entire system so the slope you want is horizontal. That's basically we want the conjugate of the slope. If s is our slope, then minus 1 over s is the slope of the right angle line. We want that right angle line pointing straight up or our desired slope to be the horizontal line. Then in that frame of reference, it's just optimizing y, that the slope is 0 at the y that is highest in this direction, which is along this line. We wouldn't know where this line is till after we did the optimization. Could be here, could be here, but it's where this horizontal line kisses the data in this orientation. So that converts it back to an optimization problem. That's kind of the magic of convex sets, that the optimization problems and the derivative structures talk about each other, that you optimize where the slope is orthogonal to the direction you go, which is a classic thing. And we want that smoothness of shapes to make that happen. Alternative two, we could plug in exactly what we know is the derivative of the slope under the beta parameterization. And so that we've, I've moved some stuff from the left-hand side to the right. It's basically the derivative of beta is always x to something times 1 minus x to something plus a, a normalization. And so it's actually we would solve this numerically. Everything except for the x's is known by fitting. So we would, could solve x just by a numeric fitter. Um, in the fully calibrated case, which is a very special case of data I'm researching where the expected value of the outcome, say one is true, zero is false, given the prediction, is always the prediction. So if the prediction says 30% chance of converting, that is what the expected value of all the observations near there is, is 30%. So this is what I call a fully calibrated classifier. Um, this is a very strong condition. Most classifiers I've encountered don't meet this condition. But if this condition held and the distributions were beta, then this is the slope. Basically, the um, again, we have why this is in this article here by this URL. But basically, the um, this A negative and A positive are within one of each other. So this slope condition, we can actually solve it because when we clear denominators, this system, X is again is the only unknown. This system is essentially linear in X. So we can actually find this on a calculator if if we are in this condition where we're fully calibrated and the two distributions are approximated by betas. However, that condition is not usually met for data. Um, this is XG boost, and we can, from an actual real problem, the KDD 2009 problem, again, the URL is here, and you can see on training data, it's not calibrated. When XG boost says there's a 50% chance of converting, you're actually converting at about 70% rate. When it says there's a 25% chance of converting, we're actually converting at about a 40% rate. So the calibration's off, however, on training data. However, oddly enough, it looks very well calibrated on its own test data. So this is exactly data that was held out and not used during training. And this line of what's the expected value of the outcome, churn, uh, this was a, an account cancellation problem, is on the line y equals x for test. So even though the data was miscalibrated on training, for this example, it is properly calibrated on test, which is an interesting point that perhaps even calibrating on training when you have overfit will not make you calibrated on test because this is uh, uh, XGBoost is overfit on the training data, but performing well on the test data. Uh, so conclusions and takeaways. The ROC plot is a classic tool from signal detection theory. Um, it's used differently classically than we use it. Frankly, most data scientists and machine learning practitioners don't do anything with the ROC plot other than use it to visualize the area under the curve or the AUC and use that area as a generic goodness for the numeric model's performance, that bigger areas are better because they subtend more, um, a better range of sensitivity specificity trade-offs. That's actually not true, that ROC plots can have different shapes. However, under the assumptions that in my articles where there's only a single parameter family, then it would be true that more area is always better. So that's a really interesting case that in general, more area is not always better because you might not be high where you're actually going to use it. You only ever use one point on the ROC plot. So the area becomes somewhat irrelevant. And um, you, to even work on the ROC plot, you have to idealize it. The empirical ROC plot is never suitable for working with even in large data sets. You have to smooth it 
or replace it with a parametric fit to do, find the matching slopes. I guess you could optimize over it directly, um, which was our re rotate. However, and this is a really good point, which I think leads into our next talk. If you're going to optimize, you might as well optimize over what you really care about, utility, not position on the ROC plot. And I think this leads us to our next speaker. Thank you very much for your time.